I was one of those kids that always wanted to be an actor. Um, that's something I always knew I wanted to do, and I don't know why, really. And I kind of got interested in acting through English at school and being in school plays and things, and I got into the National Youth Theatre. And the second year in the National Youth Theatre, I had a lead in a play, and the casting directors of Quadrophenia came to see this particular play. That was Patsy Pollock and Esther Charkham. And they took about, probably, about 20 of us to audition for Quadrophenia. Um, three or four of us got recalls the next, literally the next day, and I went up the next day, read a few scenes with Frank, and I think it was Phil, Phil Davis, and Frank offered me the part on the spot. And literally took me out of the audition room into the lineup, and put me in the lineup with the rest of them on the wall, against the wall, and took the kind of the first pictures of the cast of Quadrophenia. I was the last person to be cast, and was obviously I was exactly what he wanted, you know. And of course I knew nothing about acting, and uh, it always been my intention to go to drama school and, and do it the formal way, but um, after something like Quadrophenia, you can't go and do that really, you know. And uh, the zeitgeist of the time was just get up and do it. It was the late 70s and punk rock, and it was, you know, it's an exciting era, era to be a, a teenager, and that's what, that's what we did. We just got up and did it. You fuck all. <laughs> Absolutely fuck all about quadrophenia. You know, it wasn't a particular fan of The Who at the time. Um, but uh, I am now, of course, you know. But knew nothing, knew nothing about films or filmmaking or, you know. It was, I mean, I was, you know, I was born in 61, which was kind of the start of the mod era, really. So it's something that I really didn't know anything about. What I, what I did know about, of course, was from a, from a coastal town like Portsmouth was skinheads, which I suppose was the last of the mods. It was a certain type of mod, if you want to call skinheads mod, but I suppose they were. It's what I knew about, was skinheads and, and fights with skinheads and things, you know, and um, um, of course punk rock was the... But I knew nothing about mod. Mod was something that we explored in... We had a rehearsal period of about a month it seemed like a month, it was probably about a fortnight or so, where we were given dancing lessons and then taken out and given scooter riding lessons and then when Frank took us all out. We'd hang, just hang out with each other for about a month or so, um, which was fabulous because we're getting paid for it and we're all kids and we're, all, you know, we're doing it. So I think that really, that rehearsal period if it, as such gave something to the film, but we met some old mods, we kind of learnt the dances, we learnt a bit about the culture. So that was the kind of, that, that period of time of working in the rehearsal period was the time that I kind of learnt about the mod culture. Um, the thing that we get from a lot of 1960s mods that we weren't cool enough in the movie because we made it in 78, is we just, they were cool. You know, we were kind of punk rockers really, I suppose. I mean, punk's just a derisory term now. Um, but uh, that's one criticism from the 1960s, mods, mods were cool. I mean, it's funny, I mean, Frank would tell you a story about Roger Daltrey, Roger Daltrey would come on set and talk about there's, there's not enough mods in white jeans, because he had to think about white trousers. In Roger's eyes, that everyone in the 60s wore white trousers, you know, in actual fact, they didn't. Um, so I think Frank had quite a few discussions with uh, Roger about that, about the, the color of the, the kind of legwear in the film. It was a blast. It was fun. It was just such fun. You know, we're getting paid and we're hanging out and we've gone. The word partying wasn't invented then, you know, which is um, just great. Just what a laugh. And we do work as well. We'd rehearse and Phil was um, instrumental in doing some improvisations with us, Phil Davis, who really took it upon himself and sort of did some character work with each of us. And yeah, so it wasn't all play. It was work as well. Funny enough, the riots were probably some of the most enjoyable because, you know, you got, I think it was two, two and a half thousand mods they'd got. Um, and they, they had a fantastic stunt arranger called Pete Braham, who's now sadly no longer with us. But we'd rehearse these fight scenes, we'd rehearse the large ones, and uh, then we rehearse the little vignettes and bits and pieces. But 
my overriding memory of the fight scenes are that you do it in 10 seconds, 20 second bursts. And then everybody, mods and rockers, would just laugh their heads off after the take. There's a scene where there's some stones being thrown. Now, those stones weren't stones, they were potatoes. But if you get hit in the head by a potato, it still hurts a bit, do you know what I mean? But um, it was I mean, just a blast. It was a blast. I didn't see it until the premiere, um, which was again was an extraordinary thing. My mum and dad came up from Portsmouth and got got changed in the toilets in Leicester Square into their kind of evening dress, you know, because it was it was just that's what they did. And um, again, too young to really understand about the impact of the film. But again, I mean that that was I can talk about that was that was an extraordinary week because the film opened on a Thursday night and the, the Saturday night we had backstage passes to go and watch the Who. In Wembley, and the Who were all back. It was cool. So that was that was just a week of kind of. That was a hard week. That week. I mean, as a film, it shouldn't work. You, you know, it's a group of. It's made in 1978. It's it's set in the past in 64, 65, and it's got a progressive rock band with a soundtrack. It shouldn't really work this film, but it does, and and the music really really makes this film. I've always thought the music and the film are two very separate pieces of work. If you look at Pete's album notes in the, in the black and white version of Quadrophenia, it's a very, very different thing than the film, which is Frank's vision. Frank was an extraordinary director. The, the things that, because we're, you know, we're talking about film here, that you would not be allowed to do these days. For example, Part of that rehearsal process was we rented, they rented us 125s and gave the main cast scooters just to ride around to learn how to ride. Now, you can't imagine any company in the world doing that with a load of teenagers to rent them just motorbikes and let them just go mad on them. But we did, and that's what he did. There's also, I think, there's an element of um, serendipity, a lucky accident about this film as well, that there's many different things came together right at the exact point. And you can talk about what the film means, and we can get into some very, very deep conversations about, about what, what the film is really about, you know. And it's about all of that, and it's about an advanced um, adolescence, and it's about finding your identity, and it's about a suicide, in effect. But it's also a very, very funny film. And that humour came through the rehearsal process, and also just doing it on the... On, on, on the set. Frank was extraordinary. I mean, some scenes we would just discard and would rewrite it. And I think that shows, I mean, some of the dialogue is a bit rough, but I think that adds to the quality of the movie. We'd, we'd work out the moves and then we'd fit the dialogue to the moves almost sometimes. Or we'd know what the scene was about and then we'd just say, right, I don't want you to do what's in the script. I want you to do it in your own words. And Frank himself was given carte blanche to do what it, exactly what he wanted to do. There was no real interference and he was given free range. And I think that shows, and it was an extraordinary feat to get this film done. And he was an extraordinary director. Well, it did, because how could it not? You know, it's um, at a time when films were like hen's teeth. It was a real, I can't even, you know, it was a real kickstart, I suppose. It really kickstarted me off. Uh, immediately after the film, I went and did some stage work because I've always, always worked on stage. And then I did a t my first TV series. Then I did a TV series called Fox. And then I did another film. And for those first four or five years, as I was kind of learning my craft, it was um, it would never have happened had I not been in Quadrophenia. Well, you you can't not just by the fact of having to stand in front of a camera and, and, you know, you learn about marks, you learn where the lights are, the key lights are, you know, where the microphone is, and you do it, you do it just, you know, you have to learn that. The film is a rite of passage, especially for Jimmy, but it's a rite of passage for a lot of the other characters in the film as well, and, and that is also true, I think, of us as actors and people, is that it was our rite of passage was this film. And we have an extraordinary link when we get back together again because we, we know each other so well, even though it was 35 years ago. I don't think any of us have changed that much. So when we get back together, we, we have this, this, this... It's like we've never been apart, really. It sounds corny. You know, we were sort of a lovely family. But it's true. It's so true, because this was a rite of passage for all of us.
I think you see more things in it as you get older because, of course, you become more mature and you, you realise different facets of your own personality um, and, and things that you've lived through. And also I think you appreciate your youth more when you're older. And that's what this film is about. It's about, it's about being a teenager. I watched it with my wife not so long ago. And she said two astute things. She said, look, everybody, all those actors in that film look like they're just happy to be in the film, which is true. But she also said the really interesting thing is, which is not common these days, is the film doesn't judge anybody. There's no moral kind of um, oversight on it. There's no, there's no preaching about it. It's, this is it. And I think that's the thing about the film. It's, it is un un uncompromising in that fact that you take it or you leave it, this film.